Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inizor Education. Um, we continue talking about waves, about oscillations, to use a little bit more scientific term. Um, in this case, we will talk about uh, waves or oscillations um, inside some kind of a medium. Um, medium is basically um, used as a term in this particular case as some kind of environment uh, which basically can propagate these oscillations. For instance, air. Um, we hear the sound just because the molecules of air are delivering that sound inside our ear. Or if you, for instance, um, hit the bell with a hammer, um, you will actually even see sometimes how the whole bell is vibrating. Well, it means that inside this bell the molecules are oscillating. So, waves in the medium, that's the term of basically this particular lecture. Well, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens presented on Unisor.com. Um, that's why I suggest you to um, watch this lecture and read notes for every lecture which are basically parallel to um, to the video. Um, I'm asked a couple of times actually um, about what is the sequence of studying your course. Well, the sequence is here because everything is menu driven. You have some kind of a menu driven. First is a physics for teen as a course because there is a prerequisite course mass for teens for instance. Now the course, if you will open that menu, will open up into some kind of a subjects like in physics for instance it's mechanics maybe electromagnetism etc and then every subject when you open that particular menu will present you um, a certain number of topics and again it's top down left to left to right these topics must be addressed and each topic contains certain number of lectures devoted to this particular topic so it's like multi-layer menu um, I think it's quite conveniently presented on the web um, and that's basically the way how it's supposed to be studied um, now the website is completely free there are no advertising no strings attached you don't even have to sign in if you don't want to okay so let's go back to oscillating molecules so when we when we are talking about medium as um, the environment where waves are propagated well question is how they are propagated these waves inside the medium well obviously we are talking about oscillations of molecules now if it's something like air well the molecules of air are chaotically um, moving inside um, whatever room or wherever they are and um, and then if there is some kind of a sound which means basically I'm forcefully um, uh, trying to um, move certain molecules which are uh, very close to the source of the sound so they are moving a little bit more intensely and they have some kind of a direction from the sound to the sound from the sound to the sound because that's how the sound actually is produced right now that movement um, superposes onto the chaotic movement of the mo of the molecules themselves which creates a certain more probability to move back and forth from the source of the sound in all directions than just plain chaotical movement so if chaotical movement has let's say 50 percent probability to move to move here or there 50% here or there, and 50% there, here or there. If there is a sound, there is a like 80% probability to move from the sound and then towards the sound, then the other way around. And that's supposed to be done in sync with the m movement of the um, source of the sound, whatever that source is, like a bell, for instance, is ringing, and the sound is propagating from the bell to all the sides. So it gives a little more probability to move 
um, back and forth from the sound and towards the sound in all directions than in all other um, tangential, let's say, uh, or perpendicular to, to the direction, to the source um, uh, direction. So this more probability creates pressure, so there is a little more pressure from and to the sound in the air than uh, across, let's say, perpendicular to this direction. And that would basically propagates the waves, because eventually it reaches our ear and there is a probability of hitting the ear back and forth rather than across, which doesn't produce any sound. Now, if we're talking about um, sound inside the metal rod, for instance, you, you hit the hammer with the hammer one end of the metal, a thin metal rod, then obviously the uh, oscillation of the crystalline structure uh, at the end of the hit will be deformed a little bit and then it will return back. But this deformation will deform the next layer of the crystalline structure and then the next one, the next one, and that's how the sound is propagated towards the other end of the road. Okay, this is all nice, but as you understand, the real physical um, essence of this propagation is extremely complex. If we are talking about molecules, it's, it's definitely very, very complex. Well, first of all, the sound is uh, propagated towards all the different direction inside the medium. So it's not like a one-dimensional string when we were talking about just a string and it goes back and forth, back and forth along one dimension. That one was quite primitive relative to whatever is happening inside the medium. Let's say it's inside this crystal, uh, crystalline structure of the metal. Uh, this really kind of deforms in very, very complicated um, way. Okay, so we know that. So we have to somehow research it, we have to somehow analyze it. But what physicists do in this particular case and in many other cases when the structure is really complex, they build a model which is mathematically not as complex and just research the model see if the model produces the results which are kind of comparable with um, uh, experimental results and if they do well the model is supposed to be you know good and uh, and good for predicting for instance some um, effects or qualities for the future so that's what we are going to do we will build we will build a, a relatively simple model of how the sound is propagated inside the medium. Here is what we will do. <coughs> First of all, we will reduce our uh, three-dimensional problem to one-dimensional along a ray which goes from the so uh, source of the sound or source of the um, any kind of oscillations um, to any direction because it goes to all the direction inside the medium. So we'll choose one particular direction and we are thinking that the movement will be only along this ray from the sound towards the sound, like a spring basically, right? Now, so we have basically like many springs which are radially going out from the source of the oscillations inside the medium. Now, since we're talking about independence of these directions, let's just forget about all directions except one. So let's just consider we have one particular thin metal rod, for instance, and the width of this um, thin metal rod is so small that we can consider that one single molecule actually is uh, inside on every certain distance from each other and basically it looks like this so this is our rod very thin which has molecules one molecule per any kind of a distance and now since we are talking about propagation of the oscillations so 
if it's a crystalline structure or if it's air and then there is a chaotic movement and they are bumping into each other, we are considering that there are springs between them. So molecules have certain weight or mass, let's say. Springs have certain coefficient of elasticity between them. And that's the model which we are talking about right now. So we will talk about this particular model of how um, the oscillations, how waves are propagated inside um, any kind of a medium. So they're propagated in one particular direction from the source to whatever, whatever they go along a straight line and that straight line consists of molecules, identical molecules connected to identical strings and whenever we are basically moving one particular molecule it um, squeezes this string then it actually acts on this model uh, on this molecule it squeezes this string and that's how um, the oscillations propagate it okay so this is our model and now let's investigate this model using the apparatus which we already know the uh, Hooke's law and the second Newton's law exactly the same way as we were um, analyzing the movement of the object on the string in previous lectures related to purely mechanical oscillations well in this case <coughs> it looks like we are kind of forcing the first mo molecule with the source of the sound and then it forces the other and the other and another and at certain moment there is no more um, source of the sound there is only propagation so let's say we hit the bell with a hammer and then just you know let it go which means we basically make we made an initial um, speed basically uh, of one particular molecule and that molecule transfers these oscillations further and further okay so this is our model and let's just investigate it in some kind of a relatively simple case now the simple case is uh, to, to analyze the propagation is when I have only two molecules I will tell you a little bit later the situation with n molecules uh, along the rod, which means we're talking about propagation through n molecules, is very, very similar. But in this particular case, let's just consider that we have only two molecules, and we will examine how they act on each other. So this is my left part, this is my right part, this is my x-axis and uh, let's assume that um, left, right okay, let's assume that initially all the springs are in their neutral state so if there is no sound, I just assume that there is some kind of a neutral state. The springs are not squeezed, not stretched. Okay? And then, so if, if L is the length of the spring, then the coordinate of this will be L, coordinate of this 2L, and coordinate of this 3L. So all springs are of equal length and equal elasticity, and molecules have the same mass. So that's my... Um, uh, that, that's my basically model which we are talking about right now and let's assume that in the very beginning um, everything is in, uh, uh, at rest basically and, and the strings are in neutral position right fine now let x1 be a displacement of molecule number one and x2 will be the same for number two this is number one 
This is number two. Now, initially, both of them are at zero because we are talking about displacement, which means it's deviation from the original position because we are basically talking about oscillation, so they're going back and forth around initial position. So we're talking about, well, in this case, coordinate of the first molecule will be L plus X1 of T. Coordinate of the second molecule will be 2L plus X2 of T. Coordinate on the X axis. But we're not talking about actual coordinates, we're talking about only about displacement from the initial position. So initial position uh, initial displacement uh, is zero. That's not displacement. That's derivative. And initial position, initial displacement, displacement of the second molecule is zero. But now we have to imitate initial hit of the hammer on the uh, on, on the bell, right? So how can I do? Well, I will put a speed of the first molecule to V, and the second is zero. So at, in the very beginning, we give it a push. So it moves. And then we will see what happens with the other molecule. All right? So these are my initial conditions. Now we have to talk about differential equations, which basically describe the movement. OK, let's talk about the first molecule. What kind of forces are acting on this molecule? Well, the force of the left spring and the force of the right spring. The right spring is the one which is in the middle. Okay, so um, let's talk about force towards the first molecule from the left boundary. Now, this is fixed, we are considering, right? So, this force as a function of time according to the Hooke's law, depends on how far my displacement of this particular model actually moves from the initial position, right? So it's minus k times x1 of t. That's regular Hooke's law. So if x1 is mm, positive, so if molecule goes here, it stretches this particular spring over the neutral state and then it means it pulls it to the left and that's why it's minus and obviously the force is proportional to displacement and that's the Hooke's law what other force? well there is a middle uh, uh, spring now middle spring is not from the fixed but from the variable position of the second so my second force which acts on the first model from the second. So you see these indices, this is from the left side, and this is from the second molecule of T. Well, it depends again on the length of the spring. Now, what is the length of the spring? Well, there is initial length, and there is a displacement. So what is a displacement? Well, displacement is difference between between displacements of the molecules. So if this molecule um, is moving by x1 at moment t, and this one is moving at, uh, at distance x2 from the initial position, then the difference between these two numbers is increase or decrease of the spring between them. Right? So let's just think about now, it, and it's obviously this, it's supposed to be proportional to um, the elasticity of the spring. Now, let's think about the sign. Well, if x1 is greater than x2, so this moves to the right greater than this one moves to the right, the spring will be squeezed, right? If this moves further than this, the spring would be squeezed and the force will be to, towards the left. 
So if this is positive, the force is negative. Now, if this is negative, it means that my uh, increment of the with this molecule is less than increment of that molecule, which means spring will be stretched. And the force in this case would be towards the positive direction of the x. So if this is negative, times minus would be positive. So this is the correct formula. Great. So what is the force which acts on the first molecule? Well, it's sum of these two forces, right? So if I will sum of these two forces, I will get force acting on the first molecule, and it's equal to minus 2k x1 of t plus k x2 of t. Okay? Now, let's do exactly the same with the second molecule. Second molecule has two different, again, springs on both sides. Now, the spring which is on the right, it's attached to, uh, to the right side, right edge of the thin metal rod, right? So, from, from the right, second molecule from the right. Well, that's usual. Minus k times x to t. So if x2 positive, it squeezes the uh, the spring, so it will push it to the back, to, to the left. That's why it's minus. Now, if this molecule moves to the left, which means x2 is negative, it will stretch the spring, and it will push to a different direction. This is the Hooke's law. Now, how about force from the first molecule? How from the first? Well, obviously, it also depends on this. On difference between displacement and its proportional. Question is the sign. Well, let's just think about it again. If x1 is greater than x2, then the spring is squeezed. If it's squeezed, it attempts to uh, expand, and the left end moves, uh, forces this way, and the right end moves that way. So if this is positive, the sign should be positive here on the second molecule. And again, if it's negative, so if x1 is less than x2, which means we are basically stretching the spring, uh, then the force will be towards the left. So if this is less than this, it's negative. So this is the correct thing. And as a result, we can have that F2 of T is sum of these two forces, right? Which is what? K times X1 of T minus 2k minus x2 of t. k is 1 and minus 2k for x2. So these are our equations and now we can uh, attach second derivative. Well, let me just put it x of t, right? mx first, second derivative of time, and this is mx2 of t, second derivative. So this is acceleration, m times acceleration, that's the second Newton's law, should be equal to the force, right? Well, so we have these two differential equations. So instead of one differential equation, which we had for um, spring when mechanical oscillation. We have two because we have two molecules. Now, if we will have three molecules or four molecules, well, let's just talk about three. 
I will tell you without basically going into the details. You see, the third molecule doesn't really act on the first. On the first molecule, only the second. On the second molecules, molecule, only the first and the third are acting. So only neighbors are acting on any particular mo uh, molecule. So the whole thing will be basically very, very much like this one. Um, uh, but when I will just express it somehow differently, I will tell you how the expression will be for n molecules. Okay, so let's forget about how we derived it. So we have this system of two differential equations, linear equations, by the way. Now let's just remember that this whole course is the mathematician's view onto physics. How would mathematicians view this. They don't like the systems. They're using whatever the apparatus they have to simplify the whole thing. Now, what can we do to simplify? Well, let's consider a vector, which is basically a vector of displacement. So this is a displacement vector, which basically has two components, displacement of first and displacement of second. And let's consider a matrix minus 2k divided by m, um, k divided by m, k divided by m minus 2k divided by m. Well, if I divide m, it will be k over m, and nothing here. Now, in terms of this vector and this matrix, if you remember what is the matrix, what is the vector, and what is the multiplication of vector and matrix, you can say that the second derivative of this vector, which is the vector of second derivatives, derivative of the vector is vector of derivatives is equal to matrix times uh, well I'm using the vectors now okay so as we see we have basically an equation which very much looks like equation which we have created when analyzing the um, uh, let's let's do it slightly differently let me put this as a plus and this as a minus and then i will use plus here equals to zero zero is a vector too. Now this is exactly like equation which we have now this equation was the main equation for free oscillations of the object on the spring where x of t is basically displacement of the object. Mechanical oscillations lectures. <coughs> That's the previous topic. Had this as the main homogeneous um, differential equation of the second order, linear, by the way. And uh, we were using actual abbreviation omega square is equal to k over m. And then we had basically a solution to this. X of t was equal to d times cosine of omega t plus phi. Now this is all part of the mechanical oscillations. Now, you see equation is very much like this one. The only thing is we are using scalars here. It's a scalar function and scalar product. Here we are using vector and 
matrix, and this is vector uh, derivative, and this is the multiplication of matrix by, by vector. If the behavior of this, properly defined, is similar to the behavior of regular operations on scalars, then we can probably solve it in more or less the same way how we solved this differential equation. Basically, we were looking for this type of solution. And we found it, basically, right? We found a general solution to this, to this equation, which looks like this, with d and phi depending on initial conditions and the initial conditions we have. So here, in this particular case, when we are talking about vectors and and matrices, we kind of expect that we might proceed the same way. And obviously, people did. And, uh, well, as you see in this particular case, mathematics is really serving physis f physicists quite well. Um, actually, one um, very smart and very accomplished mathematician, um, Russian mathematician, Arnold, said once that uh, mathematics is supposed to be basically part of the physics. Because everything mathematicians did, it was not only just for their own satisfaction, it was actually used, well, almost everything, used in certain uh, very, very practical uh, situations like this one. Okay, now, how we will approach this particular differential equation with vectors and matrices? Well, that would be a subject of the next lecture. <laughs> it's like um, tales of uh, Arabian Nights. Whenever she was finishing one particular tale, she was selling. She, she was saying that Shekharizad. She was saying that okay, she did not finish this tale and said that the continuation would be tomorrow, and uh, her life was spared because of that. So I hope my life will be spared as well. And the next lecture will be devoted to this particular equation and how can we deal with it. Um, it's purely mathematics, actually, and we might have basically have this lecture in the Math for Teens course. But I think it's more appropriate here, um, even it's more like mathematics than physics, but it's very, very direct application to physics. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I suggest you to read all the notes for this lecture uh, on the unisor.com. You go to Physics for Teens, you go to Waves uh, subject, and this is Waves in the Medium topic. First lecture of this topic, actually. There will be, n well, the next one will be, for instance, a continuation of this. All right, thanks very much, and good luck.